Hey there guys, uh, John here with a new installment of my video blog and today I want to talk about five big problems I had with The Dark Knight Rises. Now uh, I've seen the film a couple times now and these five particular, a few th bunch of things have jumped out at me but these five particular things really bother me. Now before I go into it, let me give these uh, two points, very important. Number one, this video will be filled with spoilers. Filled with spoilers. I'm going to talk openly about the movie, so don't watch this video if you haven't seen the movie yet, or unless you don't care about hearing spoilers. Um, so please understand this is filled with spoilers. The second thing is this. I actually really like The Dark Knight Rises. Um, I put it on par with Batman Begins, and, but not quite as good as The Dark Knight, but then again, that was an impossibly high standard. But overall, I, I really like the film. But there are five things that really, really bother me uh, about it that I think it you know, were, were things that should have been corrected. First thing that really bothered me about this is, I'm sorry, but this is some of the worst CGI in a major big film I've seen in, in a little while. Um, now, Christopher Nolan and the Batman films have been awesome at their practical effects, but I just found the visual effects, the CGI effects in this movie were really poor and it's right from the beginning you know in the opening when you know Bane is on the one plane and the other guys from the other plane are take them and then right at the end of that sequence Bane and the doctor are hanging by a rope being pulled by the bigger plane and it's flying off in the sunset and that shot where you see Bane and the doctor hanging on the end of the rope looked so bad like I remember sitting there in theater the first time I watched the film and I saw this like oh my god that's horrible like who let that get by editorial like, who looked at that and said, yeah, good enough? And I found that ran throughout whenever, like, once again, the practical effects were great, but when they, and, and they didn't use CGI a lot in the movie, and that's good, because when they did use CGI, I mean, even the Batwing, uh, I'm sorry, the design was kind of cool, but the explosions and all that kind of stuff, it, it, I'm sorry, it, it was not up to par with today's standards. Anyway, so the CGI is one thing. Um, this other thing really bothered me, jumped out at me quite a bit. Okay, remember the scene, this is number two. Uh, let's call this point exchange light. Now remember the scene where Bane and his buddies break into the stock exchange and they're pulling off the heist in the stock exchange, right? It's, you can tell when they're going in, it's morning. Like the way the light is, it's a beautiful morning. They go in, they start shooting their guns, they start the process of getting... Uh, the information they need, but they only got a few minutes. So then they decide to leave and they get out and they get on the motorcycles and they jump the barricade and it's still bright, it's sunny, it's daytime, it's morning pretty much. And then after about five minutes of police chase, it's pitch black night. I mean, it's pitch black dark. It had to be at least 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So just like that, they went from 10 in the morning to 15 minutes later, it's 10 at night. And like just that kind of inconsistency, that's, that's film school. I mean, that, that kind of major flaw and inconsistency is kind of startling to me. So that, that threw me off. That was kind of bad. The third thing, and we're getting into, we're going in levels of seriousness here. The third thing that really bothered me about The Dark Knight Rises was the whole romance with Talia al Ghul. Of course, you didn't know she was Talia at first, but Kate, Bruce Wayne is so distraught and so heartbroken and so destroyed by the loss of Rachel that he hasn't never forget that he's never been with any other women since then he's been locked away he's been a recluse he's been guarded away in his little house and hasn't seen or talked to anybody for years okay but then he bumps into Marianne Cotillard at a party for about 15 seconds and the next thing you know, they're in love and they're making love in front of the fireplace and he's willing to sacrifice his life for her. I'm, I'm sorry. Like that was such a leap of literary faith that you're expecting us as an audience to take. Like that was just, it was ridiculous. It was so silly. Bruce Wayne, so distraught, so heartbroken, eight years recluse, never gotten over Rachel, but bumps into this other girl for 15 seconds and boom, he's betting her. So... That kind of bothered me a little bit. Uh, the number four thing that bothered me about this film, and this is, this is significant, okay? Now look, I understand. Now let's call this five months to foil plot. I understand Bane took Bruce Wayne down into uh, the prison and said to him, I want Gotham to feel 
despair, and you can't feel real despair unless you think there's hope. And so I'm going to give them hope. And uh, you know this whole long diatribe. But look, look, the basic of the thing is this. Talia al Ghul's mission was to fulfill the destiny of her father, which was just destroy Gotham. Raj al Ghul in the first one was just out to destroy Gotham, and he was about to destroy it the moment he got his hand on the weapon he needed. He's going to push the button. But you get Talia al Ghul and Bane, and they say their big mission is to destroy Gotham. But wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Okay, we got the nuclear bomb now, but let's not destroy Gotham yet. Let's wait, I don't know, five months. Let's give all of our enemies five months to foil us. Let's not make it easy by just blowing up Gotham now and fulfilling my father's destiny, which allegedly is her whole driving purpose. No, no, no. Let's give everybody five months to pick up on our plot and foil us. That, that to me, that just, it's stupid. That was a really bad plot device. It made, to me, it made no sense. Notwithstanding that little speech by Bane, I want to give them hope. Like, you had the bomb. Your, your whole goal is to destroy Gotham. Hit the button. Destroy Gotham. But no, we got to wait five months. So that was a really weak, I thought that was a very weak plot device. And the fifth thing that bothered me, and this bothers me most of all, and in the grand scheme of things means the least, but this part really, really bothered me. Remember that horrible uh, George Clooney Batman movie? Well, one of the things in that horrible George Clooney Batman movie that made me laugh and roll my eyes the most is you had this little blonde girl who she happens to find the Batcave. And since she found the Batcave, Batman and Robin just looked at each other and thought, well, good enough, you can be Batgirl. Because, for why? Because she found the cave. You get to be Batgirl. It was ridiculous. And I'm sorry, but the fact that the end of this movie suggests that Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character kind of takes over the mantle of the Bat and becomes the Batman was ridiculous. I'm sorry, you had literally a two and a half minute meeting with Bruce Wayne letting him know, oh, by the way, uh, I know who you are. And that was ridiculous, too. I'm sorry. Joseph Gordon-Levitt. When I was a 12-year-old kid, I saw you smile in a weird way once. And right then I knew you were Batman. What? what? That makes no sense. Commissioner Gordon couldn't figure it out. But Joseph Gordon-Levitt, yeah, when I was 12, I saw you smile. And it looked like a fake smile. So I figured out you were Batman. Come on. And then, so he meets with him for two and a half minutes. Then he gives him a ride home from Wayne Industries one day. Remember, Bruce Wayne comes down. He gets He just got kicked off the board. Joseph Gordon-Levitt goes, oh, I'll give you a lift. That's it. We don't, we don't even know if Joseph Gordon-Levitt can fight. He's a short, little, skinny guy. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm talking about the character. Joseph Gordon-Levitt's an awesome actor. I love him. But, I mean, he's this small, little, skinny guy um, who we see in the film, I think, have one fight, maybe two fights against one guy and kind of barely get out of it. He gets captured by the thugs at one point. Batman's got to save him. Um, and... Because of that, because when you were 12, you saw him smile and you figured out who he was Batman, and because you gave him a ride home from Wayne Enterprises one day, you get to be the next Batman? Is that what it really, that's all it takes? I mean, yes, he's a good man. He's a man with conviction. He's a man who loves the city. He's a man who has, who's an orphan like Bruce Wayne. I get all that, and all that's important. But Bruce Wayne trained under Ra's al Ghul for seven years to become a ninja to come then come back and become the Batman. And the fact that Joseph Gordon-Levitt, hey, you give me a ride home one day, you get to be the next Batman. I just thought that was completely ridiculous. Now listen, let me once again point out, I'm just pointing out the things that drove me crazy. There are a lot of things I loved about The Dark Knight Rises, and I like this film very much. I put, like I said, I put it on par with Batman Begins. I don't think it's quite as good as uh, The Dark Knight, but uh, I really enjoy the film. But just because I enjoy it doesn't mean I'm going to, cover my eyes and pretend like the stupid things weren't there. And those are five stupid things that I think were there. Anyway, I'd love to know your thoughts. Were there other things that I'm missing here that really bothered you? Do you think I'm crazy? Do you think none of these things should bother me? Let me know your thoughts. I'd love to hear them. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, my name's John Campia. Bye-bye.